Good morning ladies and gentlemen, I'm Nick Horton and today we're going to be taking a look at a few wildfowling curiosities. Some rather unusual big bore wildfowling guns introduced to us today by their owner, like myself, another fanatical wildfowler, Mr Lee Freeston. Hi guys, my name's Lee Freeston, I'm the former chairman of Chillister Wildfowlers. Just to give you a little bit of a background on myself, I started wild fowling in 1982 in Pagham Harbour, which we unfortunately don't shoot anymore. Then went on to shoot Chichester Wildfowlers in Chichester Harbour, and I still am a member of Chichester Wildfowlers, as well as uh, joining Langston Wildfowlers at the, around about the same time. I um, was involved with the um, <clears throat> setting up of the Solent Wild Fowling Forum along with uh, Nick Horton alongside of me and latterly I was a BASC council member for 10 years um, and in those 10 years for seven of them I was the chair of the Wild Fowling Liaison Committee and for my last three years on council chairman of the Executive and Finance Committee overseeing the uh, financial stability of the association along with other things but perhaps that's for another day and whilst we're talking of uh, BASC those of you who are Basque members would have had your shooting and conservation magazine delivered through your letterbox recently and if you turn to page 24 I think it is you will find the nominations for Basque Council. My suggestion to you would be that A, you take part in this democratic process and B, if like me you're a very keen wildfowler, that you have a careful read of the CVs of the people who've put their names forward. Um, for me there is one that jumps off the page. It's Mr John Andrew Harlow. I won't read you his CV but the gist of it is that he's a, an extremely keen and experienced wildfowler uh, and I'm sure if elected to council um, he will assist in steering some of council's decisions in an appropriate direction. Lee, going back to what you said a moment ago, you've done quite a bit of punt gunning. I, I know I've been with you on a number of occasions. <laughs> <laughs> We've shared uh, some of the sort of more dry mouth uh, moments that one gets with punting and I have a, a, an abiding uh, memory of a trip late one afternoon crossing from north to south on the Emsworth Channel to, to, to get back to the slipway um, when the, the, the weather really cut up rough. Now uh, we ended up rowing double-handed on a big 23-24 foot double-handed punt, Lee's big double punt, with, with a large 130 pound gun on the, uh, on the bow and with a single set of oars I was push rowing and Lee was sitting with his back to the bow and and pulling and pushing alternatively on the same pair of oars so we were moving at a fair old lick but lee had his back to the sea and i don't know whether you could see much of the time where we were going but i can assure you that probably for the hundred yards across the deep part of the middle of that channel the entire foredeck of the punt was underwater <laughs> um, and the only thing that you could see was the gun that was just sticking up above the waves. That particular moment sticks in my memory. That's um, that, that's that's a long-term investment in, uh, in in the fear factor of of, of punt gunning. You, you've got a few punt guns, I believe. Yeah, I've got several punt guns. Well, I'm I'm I'm, I'm going to be modest and just leave it like that, Nick. At okay. this stage, but <laughs> perhaps at some point in the not too distant future, we can have a look at. Uh, a look at some of them. There's some interesting yeah. ones amongst them. I, I would like to display them um, because they're each and every one is unique in its design, the way it operates, the way it loads, and even the way it sits on the boat. So I think that's that can make some very interesting videos at a later date. But I too have also got some interesting memories. Quite often I do a lot of punk gunning on my own, and on a couple of occasions I have actually seen the waves rolling up the deck and thinking, ah this is getting interesting and having to kneel right the way back in the end of the back end of the punt and push row like that to try and keep the bow out of the water from sinking. Yes, I think it comes with the territory. I, I've never had to do this. You've never had to ditch the gun overboard? No. 
where I punt is local. I've lived there all my life. I've fished in the harbour, sailed in the harbour. I know the tides, I know the currents, I know the winds. I know where I can, I can I've got bolt holes yes. all over the place I can get to should it get, get really bad. So uh, today we're gonna to take a look at some of your uh, extensive collection of large bore shoulder guns. Um, in front of us, we've got a particularly interesting single barreled four bore. Lee, perhaps you could talk us through it. Yeah, this was my first purchase of a large four bore wild fowling piece, probably about mm, 30 years ago. It's an Alan Myers four bore, a true four bore. That's an inch in the barrel, 26 millimeters. It was one of his first guns made at his property in Garstang in Lancashire. I think it's Three Oak Grove, somewhere in Garstang in Lancashire. If you want to come to... Sorry, I'll just get a bit of yeah. extra B-roll. Can you just touch that for me? Okay, we'll see in a minute. This is one of his early guns. It's number three, I believe, made in 1978. Very interesting. I got it for a very good price from F.A. Anderson in West Su East Sussex. Also sitting along there is the bill from the Birmingham Proof House and it was the exorbitant price of four pounds and 28 pence to have it proofed. I'm sure the Proof House will love me saying that. But there you go, a little bit of history there. The gun you see is somewhat cruder than the, the latter one. Okay, well that's the gun fully assembled now. You see from the actual action, very basic, no engraving, blacked throughout, quite a simple um, lettering on top, which I think is basically a bit of bronze welding laid into some stamped num letters and numbers. Yeah, I think that'll come through there. Very acute angle on the trigger with this. And there has been, we've had some work done over the years and a stronger spring put in it, actually getting it to strike the primers hard enough on occasions. but. There you go, I guess you can say work in progress. This is the case it come with. Simple nipple re removing tool there to take your nipple out. It also comes with the prescribed measures for your powder and shot. And Am I right in thinking that this gun snap. is nitro proofed? Yes, it is nitro proofed for four and a half ounces with nitro cellulose behind it, should you so desire. Have you fired it with a nitro laser? No, I have not. And would, you I want, would you want to fire it with a nitro I've laser? got no intention of trying to fire it with nitro. <laughs> Firing 10 cartridges at four and a half ounces and 10 dram, 10 or 12 drams of powder. I boxed as a teenager and you feel like you've been in a boxing ring afterwards. It's not... <laughs> not a lot of fun. Not a lot of fun. Great for, for, for shooting geese, which is exactly what it's designed for. Definitely not a duck shooting gun. <laughs> Great fun. I bought these so myself and my brother could shoot on the foreshore in Scotland successfully and make clean kills. And that's what this gun will do. Absolutely no doubt about it. Point it in the right direction. Anytime, every time it does the business. I noticed we've got a, a jar of, is that power shot? Yeah. What is power shot exactly? It's a mixture of steel, tungsten and a bit of nickel or a bit of bronze copper put together in a mould as a powder then induction heated so it then solidifies and makes a round ball. It is heavier than steel and even heavier than lead. They say it's about 13 grams per cubic centimetre. So it is a very dense product. Very hard. I use it in all my cartridges for geese because there's no substitute for it. it. It shoots very tight. When it hits, it does the business, brings the bird down. Bit expensive, but at the end of the day, you go wild fowling, you've driven all the way to Scotland, and you skimp on the cartridges. What, what are you, what's that all about? It's the quality of your ammunition which gets you the goose. In, in the sense that we've got the other gun to, uh, to to go to, have we talked through most of the features on this one? It's a four and a, qu four and a quarter inch chamber? Four and a half inch chamber. Four and a half inch chamber. Yeah, four and a half inch chamber. Choke? Full choke. 
and a full full four bore. Yeah, yeah. This produces very 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 tight patterns. I mean, I mean I'm always loath to to put numbers to these sort of things, but because it, it is the rocket launcher par excellence, what would you imagine its effective killing range to be? Assuming that you're a good enough shot to right maximise on on the range. You can shoot. You can shoot geese if you know where to point this gun at eighty plus yards. Yeah, with power shot. But you, you really have to be been on the foreshore for a few years to under, actually understand the size of the goose before you can actually pull the trigger and then work out how far in front of it you've got to pull that trigger. Yes. And I like it because it's a single barrel. You cannot. You've got no second shot. You have to place your place your shot. Take your time to make the kill. It's interesting you say that. Many uh, many years ago, I had one of the um, single barrel ten bores by Harrington yes. and Richardson, a hideously crude thing, but uh, it, it had the handling characteristics of a cricket bat. But in the days of lead wild fowling cartridges, with a three and a half inch ten bore, you know, 50, 60, 70 yards easily. But you had to have at those sort of ranges a completely different shooting technique and and I've often um, when firing it but particularly on a couple of places that you'll recognize um, on the west side of Thorny Island the Thorn and Wall when you get packs of widgeon coming over at a tremendous altitude you shoulder the gun and you'd swing through them and you'd quite happily lift your head off the stock and kind of look round the barrel to con confirm the sort of distance that you were shooting in mm. front of the birds a and sometimes when you try to explain to that that to someone who is used to shooting um, out to more conventional uh, ranges with an over and under or a side by side and they think oh no no you can't you don't do that but you do and well, it works well it works the other thing i always always say to people just imagine a volvo estate car with a caravan on the back and that, that'll give you some idea of the lead and that's it that works for me won't work for other people it's a personal thing my you know the lead that you use but you'll only, you'll only get that by going out and using it and they don't sell that at this sort of ammunition you have to make it yourself and, and it's it is really spectacular in use i, I well remember on one occasion um, uh, again down the west side of Thorny uh, I, I was out there with my eldest son that morning um, you, you'd arrived from a different direction he was sat about 50 yards from me you, I'd seen you you'd position yourself um, about 100 yards uh, d down the wall I think he may have been aware of the fact that you were there but didn't know what you were shooting <laughs> so of course Lee's first shot of the day is a six foot and more stab of flame going up vertically um, a shower of confetti and an ear-splitting boom, um, and that certainly woke him up on that uh, on that particular morning. Is it worth taking a look at the other gun, the other four? Yep, it is. As you can see, a completely different gun, guys. A much more rounded, rounded action, colour case hardened, much larger lock, Jones underbite, more substantive gun, substantive gun altogether. They're, they're all used, I use them every year, so they're, uh, they're not in pristine condition. Rebounding hammer on this one, the top's a lot, lot cleaner. This one's number 15, so that one, the previous one was number 3. This one's slightly heavier and the stock is slightly longer, which works very well because my brother's about 3 or 4 inches shorter than me, so a very, very good gun. That's gun number 3 with the, the case, <coughs> different shoulder on, on it. It's a square shoulder, and on this one we've got a radius shoulder, so the cartridges are not interchangeable. Alan played around with some plastic cases, but they never really worked. He was trying to emulate the active Raynal cartridge there, which is a completely different type of plastic. Very, very durable, obviously waterproof, ideal wildfowling cartridge. I keep them as a curio. The chamber in this is too big for those, and if you fire them they just split. So anyway, what what, is, what do they weigh individually? I think they're fairly close. Oh, uh, they're about twenty pounds each. Twenty pounds, which is what? That's certainly twice, getting on for three times the weight of your average. Yeah, two and a half times. Yeah, and, yeah. And carrying it that for long distances, presumably if you can't get someone else to do it. First year I purchased this one, and I had the other one as well. Myself and my brother and a friend drove all the way to the Dornock Firth in Scotland. Done a little bit of research 
um, looking at the map really and thinking well we know the geese are there where are they going to be yeah that didn't ask anybody we drove 720 miles got out the car well we slept in the car for about four hours got out the car went onto the foreshore got behind some boulders and two shots later both me, myself and my brother had shot grey leg goose each and the rest of the two weeks was just we'd done it yeah <laughs> didn't matter and now for something completely different definitely different this is a single barrel eight bore made by a guy in Annan in southern Scotland in Galloway. It's called an Afton Gunworks 8 bore. Somewhat unique. Again, I managed to pick this one up at Holtz Auction. Think of a Sharps rifle and the Sharps trapdoor. There we go. Sharps trapdoor rifle drops down an exceedingly strong action and the cartridge goes in like that. It's 36 inch barrel. Extra full choke, used with power shot again. Very, very good gun. As you can see, it's well worn because it gets used every year. I prefer a single barrel to a double barrel for wild fowling. You're there to shoot a duck. You're not there to be a machine gunner with these three shot things nowadays. Although that being said, I do use them. But there you go. Not a pretty gun, but a very, very lethal tool against geese. Now what I will say, after having the two four bores, I'd had several eight bores, English eight bores, and was never really impressed because some of them were bored out ten bores, didn't last very long, bulged barrels, etc., with modern nitro loads. I saw this one with a solid, thick steel barrel, and I thought that's what I want to shoot geese with. Developed a load with power shot of two and a quarter ounces, and to be honest with you, there's not a lot of difference between that and a four ball on the foreshore when you shoot. The only difference is that's lighter. Joke. Full, extra full. I don't know how many guns this guy made. I have seen three in my life. I live in Emsworth. There's another guy in Emsworth who had one. He bought it directly from the maker. And there's another guy down in West Sussex. All club members, obviously, we're not. The, the, the chamber length on this gun? Three and a quarter inches. Three and a quarter. Mm. He, he, excuse me. I'm first. I've you know, I've been uh, aware of that. I'm mildly surprised that he didn't go for something a bit longer. When would these have been built? Early eighties. So you'd, he, he would have been past the time when Ely eight bore ammunition was still reasonably available in some of the longer chamber lengths. So presumably he was building this gun at the time that the Remington industrial cases which are three and a quarter were filtering through to the market that's absolutely right nick there's there's a three and a quarter inch remington kiln blasting case <coughs> and there's a winchester winchester kiln blasting case as well that one's a little bit shorter but that's by the by one of the guns i'd seen he'd made with brass cases eight ball brass cases that was not so successful. The guy who was loading with those cases was getting a swelling round about where I'm putting my fingers now and consequently there was extraction problems. Unfortunately when the guy had built the gun it wouldn't take the kiln blast in case so he was kind of um, hamstrung as to what he could use yeah. and type of loads. The other thing is if you've only got a three and a quarter inch case you can't get magnemitis with it. Um, with the, I think they're about four inch cases, or even four and a half, some of the old black powder. Four and a quarter. Four and a quarter, yeah. Thin brass case, super magnum. Super magnum. Well, if you're not careful, you could um, you could put yourself a stick of dynamite in your hand with something like that. And at the end of the day, a good cartridge is a balanced cartridge. A square load is what you're near enough looking for. And about two, in, two ounces, two and a quarter ounces out of an eight ball is about right. Always works. Fantastic. I think we've covered all the all the technical spec. That would keep me and the uh, and, and the other big little nerds happy for, uh, for for a couple of hours. Thank you very much indeed for coming along. It's been a real eye opener, and I hope to uh, revisit some of your extremely entertaining collection of punt guns in in due course. I look forward to that. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Nick.